So I would like to continue and finish the, uh, the topic that we started last week. Uh, I remind you that we started talking about uh, a probabilistic view of uh, image processing. So we started defining some elementary notions like um, the notion of a random signal or a stochastic process. Um, it's first and second order moments, right? We defined uh, autocorrelation functions and cross-correlation functions. We also talked about wide sense stationarity and uh, mm -hmm. basically once we had uh, wide sense stationarity, we could uh, describe the autocorrelation function as a translation equivariant entity and therefore we could uh, describe it in the, in the Fourier domain. And th this is a very useful notion. So we, we, I, I will, I'm going to show to show it to you today when um, when we are going to derive the the Wiener filter. Uh, and the purpose of this entire exercise is to uh, approach the solution of uh, inverse problems. Okay. So I just remind you that our uh, problem of interest is uh, the recovery of some latent image f that is not directly observable. It is observable through some forward model, typically some degradation process. So this degradation process will model that something that happens in an imaging system. For example, this operator H doesn't need to be a linear operator, right? This degradation H, for example, can be the action of some imperfect optics. And this N, this noise can be, for example, the, the action of some imaging noise that we talked about last week. Uh, this can, for example, come from a photon counting. It, it will have Poisson, uh, Poisson uh, statistics. It might come from other sources of noise in an imaging system. So this is a very typical scenario. I, I bet uh, if you think of image processing as some general problem, probably 90% of the tasks that we can think about can be fit into this, uh, uh, into this setting. And of course, we are interested in estimating f given the measurements y, right? So we have a forward model that models how an unknown, a latent signal gives us the measurements and we, we want to invert this model. We want to solve the inverse problem. We want to get the latent signal given the observations, right? So in some simple setting, it will amount to solving a system of equations, but we would like to, to do more, okay? So and, uh, what, what I, I'm going to try to convince you today that uh, this probabilistic formulation will be very useful because it will allow us, it will uh, give us a very uh, straightforward way to inject our knowledge about uh, the family of signals we are trying to reconstruct. Okay, and w what we are going to do next, uh, it will be a pursuit of different priors, different models for images that uh, can be injected into the solution of inverse problems. Okay, so this is, this is at least this is how I see image processing. Uh, I guess uh, I guess there are many many works that uh, have have been published to uh, to derive better models, better priors for uh, uh, for images, and uh, what I claim that they can all fit into this framework. Okay, so again, the way we would like to approach this solution of an inverse problem, we de we will define some error signal. By the way, it doesn't need to be necessarily a difference, but at least for for our convenience now, let's think of this as a difference. This is the difference between the true, the ground truth latent signal and its estimate, which I denote by f and f hat, respectively. Okay? So we, we have this error signal, and I, I will define some optimality criterion. I will call it epsilon. So epsilon, you give, give me your error signal, and, and I tell you how how good is your estimate, okay? And I can think of my uh, the solution of inverse problem as minimizing this error criterion over all possible estimates f hat, okay? So to me, this is, uh, I, I will hypothesize my latent signal, and this criterion will tell me how well my hypo hypothesis works. So again, an estimator, uh, let, let, me, let me be completely explicit, this f hat, of y. Of course, it's a stochastic quantity, right? Because y is a stochastic quantity, but it is obtained by some deterministic transformation. Let, let me call it, let me call it g, g of y. g is a function. It's just a function. 
So my, I'm building a deterministic function that takes my measurement and gives me the latent signal. Of course, if I plug in a, a stochastic quantity, which is, my, which is what my measurement is, right, then I will, will also get a stochastic signal. Okay, but the, the estimator itself is deterministic. Well, we'll, we'll see more about it. So just a very simple example. Suppose my forward model is a convolution. And this is a very typical scenario you have seen in the tutorial and you will see more. For example, I have motion blur or some out of focus blur. So this blur can be described by a kernel H. And let's talk about some kind of kindergarten setting where the blur is known. So you calibrated your, your camera, you know perfectly the, uh, the point spread function, the PSF of your optics. So you measured it in the lab, you know how, how it behaves. You cannot eliminate it optically, because it's very difficult to build the perfect lens, but you know what your lens is, so you know this H. This is called a non-blind setting. The, the real setting is where you don't know your point spread function. You don't know your convolution kernel, and this is called blind deconvolution. For example, you took an image with your hand shaking. This, even if you are a healthy person, it, it will still shake a little bit. When you take a long exposure, this will be visible, and you will have a blurred image. But you don't really know how exactly the blur kernel looked like. Even if you measure the the if you measure the accelerations and the angular basically uh, by, by taking the readings from the gyros and the and the accelerometers in, in this sm smartphone, uh, you will only have some uh, some estimate of the point spread function because the true point spread function in the image plane also depends on the three dimensional configuration of the scene that you that you are imaging. Okay, so it, of course this measurement can help, but it will not completely uh, resolve your ambiguity or your uh, um, uncertainty of the of the point spread function. And that setting is of course way more complicated. So again, let's talk about this toy problem. We know the blur. There are many useful problems where you you do know the blur. Uh, so this is your forward model, and your inverse model. Suppose your estimator is restricted to this class of functions. You are doing convolution with, with some other kernel G. Okay, so you take your measurement, you convolve it with some system G, and this is how you obtain your measurement. So again, remember, I told you that my estimator is a deterministic function, right? So this is a deterministic function. You just convolve your input with G. G is, G is a deterministic quantity. Of course, when you convolve a stochastic signal, which Y is, uh, with G, you get a stochastic quantity F hat. And then again, I'm distinguishing between deterministic signals and stochastic signals. I'm using this funny calligraphic script for stochastic quantities, okay, and capital letters. So this gives you a stochastic quantity F hat, which is a function of Y. You can think of it as a random signal that is obtained by some transformation, in this case, a linear transformation, actually a translation equivariant transformation of Y. And you are going to get this error signal, which is obviously f minus g convolution with y. Okay, this is your error signal. And now you would like to estimate your g. You would like to solve for an optimal g. Okay? So g is your parameter now. This is your optimization variable. So solve for, for the best g. And of course we can argue uh, it's, it's a very important question and we'll, I, will, I will try to address it uh, in the sequel, but let's choose this optimality criterion. And a very, very pragmatic choice is to choose the, the what is called the MSE, the mean squared error. So I will take my error signal, I will square it, and take the expectation of the result. Okay. So of course, this e, this e is is a stochastic process, right? It's a function of x, but I will assume stationarity assumptions. Okay, so if I assume wide sense stationarity, this expectation will not really depend on x, right? I can I can measure it at any x; it will be the same result because of wide sense stationarity. Of course, in reality, signals don't behave this way. But any anything we can, anytime we can assume, so anytime we cannot assume stationarity, we can assume it in a sufficiently small local region. Okay. But let's assume in our again toy example. Let's assume that uh, the signal is really um, wide sense stationary, stationary, and therefore we can uh, we can measure the MSE at a single point. Okay. 
So basically, if I can, so the way I can write it, but what is written here is the expectation of ex, ex plus zero, right? The zero vector, and this is exactly what what was the uh, autocorrelation of function of e at point zero, right? And again, once I can uh, I, once I can write the autocorrelation, uh, or at least I can write the autocorrelation as a function of a single argument only if I assume wide sense stationarity, right? Because that g gave me the translation equivariance of this function. Otherwise, it would be a function of two arguments, of x and of x plus zero. Okay. Now let's evaluate this function. So again, I I uh, I evaluate it at a general x, and then I'm going to substitute uh, x equals zero. Okay. So I evaluate the autocorrelation function at x. This is the definition. Of course, I can start it at zero. I can start it at any point. Doesn't matter because uh, because we are uh, because this quantity is invariant to translations. And this is this is the uh, so I'm spelling out f right f is the difference between f and f hat so uh, sorry I'm spelling out e e is the is the difference between f and f hat okay so I'm evaluating it at zero I'm evaluating it at x okay so let's just open the parentheses do the product so I have this and then move the expectation inside. Expectation is linear. A question? So the question is why do, why do I start at zero? So the autocorrelation function of, of a wide uh, sense stationary uh, process, I can write this. It can be an error at some point, let's call it uh, p, and another point p plus x. And it doesn't, doesn't matter which p I take because uh, this quantity is shift invariant, right? This is what stationarity gave us. The function is is only a function of the difference of the arguments and not of the absolute locations. Okay, so I'm I'm, I'm assuming wide sense stationarity. Otherwise, the uh, otherwise all the all this machinery becomes inconvenient. So I I, I will have better machinery. I will show it to you uh, afterwards. But but basically, working with these second order moments and uh, translation equivariant systems. Mean, uh, is meaningful only if we assume wide sense stationarity. Otherwise, it's just a mess. Okay, so I move the expectation inside, and this is what I get. So basically, the, you, you see, when I move the expectation inside, these terms are going to reduce to autocorrelations and cross-correlations, right? So the first term, the expectation of F0, Fx, is the autocorrelation of F at point X. This is uh, the cross-correlation of uh, of uh, f hat, so sorry, this is the autocorrelation of f hat at point x. This is the uh, this is the cross correlation of f and f hat at point x, and this is with the term here is the cross correlation of f hat and f at point x, or if you will, the cross correlation of f f hat at point minus x. Okay. Quite easy, just simple algebra and the definition of, of auto and cross correlation. Okay, I can take it now to the Fourier domain. Okay, so you can think you can think of uh, of the Fourier domain as b b well because we just have a function uh, of a single argument. We can always express it, it as a Fourier transform. This is a deterministic quantity. The autocorrelation is a deterministic quantity. So we can take it to the Fourier domain, and then instead of R, I'm, I'm going to write S. We call this the spectrum or the, the power spectral density. And there is actually a profound connection between this quantity, which is just the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function, and the amount of energy that we have per unit of frequency of the stochastic quantity. Yeah, uh, we we call this the wiener kinchin theorem last last week. Uh, but to me, this is just a convenient uh, way of uh, working in the frequency because, as we know, convolution will become pointwise product. I want to work with this diagonalized form, uh, so I'm I'm moving to the frequency domain. Obviously, all the autocorrelations become spectra. The cross correlation become the cross spectra. And now I would like to write my MSE in the Fourier domain. So I will. Uh, so what is what is the? How can I write in the Fourier domain the value of a function at zero? 
I can write it as the inverse Fourier transform. I can write it basically the inverse Fourier transform of S substituting x equals zero. Okay, so this is x equals zero. Okay. And well, because because of the duality of the of the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform, just think of this as the dual of the DC response of uh, of a function. Okay. So I'm simply integrating. You, you see, this exponential, of course, is identically one for every for every xi for every frequency. So I'm just writing the integral of the of the spectrum. Remember, the spectrum is an, is a real non-negative quantity, right? I didn't prove it to you, but the proof is quite elementary. This stems from the fact that the autocorrelation itself is a positive uh, semi-definite function. Okay. So I'm integrating the spectrum, and this gives me the autocorrelation at zero. Okay? So let's substitute now this quantity here. Let's spell it out. And of course, I can just remove this substituted by one. This is just a decoration. It doesn't, doesn't change the, the value of the integrand. So I'm spelling out the, uh, the expression of, of this SE, the spectrum of the error signal. Let's write it this way, okay? And let's remember that what is f hat? f hat is g convolved with y, right? So our inverse model, out of a zillion of possible estimators, I'm selecting an estimator belonging to this class of functions. Okay, so I'm restricting my class of functions. I would like it. I would like the inverse operator to look like convolution with some system, which of course is a restriction, right? Maybe I can do better if I if I look at some general class of transformation, maybe something nonlinear, maybe something not necessarily uh, translation equivariant. But you will see good expressions and nice closed form results when, when we uh, do this restriction. Okay? So, of course, what is the spectrum of F, obviously, F hat? Pardon the bug. Uh, so, uh, the spectrum of, uh, of F hat, we already saw that last week, right? We, we saw what happens to the autocorrelations and to the spectra uh, of a wide sense stationary signal when it goes through a, a linear translation equivariant system. So w what will happen to the spectrum? It is going to be colored by the power response of the system G. And the power response uh, is, uh, is the absolute value of G squared in the Fourier domain. I'm not writing psi, but of course this is true for every psi, for every frequency. Okay, so let's substitute this result uh, here below. Of course, we also need the cross spectra. So the cross spectrum of f and f hat. Remember again, this was the this was the cross spectrum be be uh, between the input and the output to a to a linear system G. Right? We had uh, y entering here, system G and f hat exiting. Right? So we we computed last week the spectrum of this signal and the cross spectrum of this and these signals, right? And this is what it is given by. It is given by g g star g complex conjugate uh, of the cross spectrum between f and y, okay? And I will assume that I know this quantity and I know this quantity, okay? So I can. So I'm not measuring the signal itself, but suppose I can. I, I can measure. I can measure the properties of y. That is not very difficult, right? Because I'm, I'm observing y directly, and I will assume that I, I know these cross statistics between the latent signal f and the measurement y. So that is more complicated. If I know the, uh, even if I know the forward model perfectly, I don't have access to f, right? So basically, by assuming that I know s f y. I assume that I know something about the distribution of f, okay? So I, I, when I show to you afterwards that the Wiener filter is a particular form of a Bayesian estimator, a Bayesian estimator requires a prior on the signal. So this is where my prior about the signal uh, comes into into the play. Uh, into the play. I don't. I'm still not calling it by this name, but but basically I need I need some knowledge about the distribution of my latent signal, and this is where uh, this knowledge is embodied in this setting, okay? So once I have these two expressions, let's substitute them into the into this integrand, okay? So you, you, will, you see this 
it's a mess, but nothing nothing particularly uh, complicated. Uh, of course, S F is just constant, right? It doesn't depend on G. Remember, G is our parameter. We would like to optimize. We'd like to minimize this expression. I would like to minimize it with respect to G, to the to the impulse response or the frequency response of this system G that does the estimation that solves the inver pro inverse problem. So uh, the terms that do depend on G, we have this this term, we have this term, and we have this term. And of course, just remove this complex exponential, just one. Okay. Now what you see here, these are all real valued uh, uh, quantities. Okay. So we have this integral. Let's write it in a slightly uh, in a slightly better form. Okay. I would like to. So let me just show it again. If I want to bring this to minimum, I would like to uh, I would like to minimize the integrand at every point xi at every frequency xi. Okay. So we have this non-negative integrand. We would like to minimize it at every point uh, in frequency. So let's just drop the xi and minimize this over g. Okay, and I'm writing g, of course, I should be uh, writing uh, all these quantities at every point psi, okay? But basically, the integrand, uh, the integrand splits into, uh, into minimization problems with respect to, to the value of g at every frequency, okay? Now, uh, so let's take this expression. It looks, it almost looks like like a, f a square of something, right? I I would really like the, like to write it as as the square of the difference or the absolute value squared of the difference, right? So if I write it like this, if I write it, uh, so you see, you, you, I have here g g uh, uh, g complex conjugate of s y. Then I have g g star s f y and g s f y star, right? And then some constant here. So it really looks like like the square, a complex square, right? So it, it is some difference times the same difference conjugated. So I can write it this way, but it will not give me exactly the same expression. So in order to fix it, I will need to subtract this quantity here. Okay, so now it is exactly the same. I, I rewrote it as this, uh, this square minus some quantity, but pay attention, what is written in this parentheses does depend on G. I have G here and G here. This doesn't depend on G, so this is a constant in G. Okay, so of course, when uh, when I am to minimize with respect to G, this is just a constant. I don't care about it. So let's let's not spell it out. I will write it as a constant. And what I have in the parentheses is the absolute value square of G S Y square root. I can write the square root because S Y is a non-negative quantity uh, minus S F Y over S Y square root, everything absolute value squared. Now, uh, pay attention that I might have this quantity equal to zero, right? So in that case, I cannot divide by SY. But basically what I can, I can say that at those frequencies where SY uh, square root or SY vanishes, I will simply treat this expression differently, okay? So let's assume that SY is strictly positive and if it is not positive, basically, I, it means that I have no I have no measurement, right? If I have no measurement, I can be, I can uh, I can make my system arbitrary, right? This quantity will anyway be zero. Okay, so I can simply decide that whenever I have s y equals zero, I will fix g to be zero. I can fix g to be one million; it will give the same result because I have no energy at that point. Okay, so no input means that any system will produce zero, but I will arbitrarily fix it to zero. Okay, and otherwise, I have this expression. Any questions? So let's just take this expression and minimize it with respect to G. Okay, so if I need to minimize this absolute value squared with respect to G, what is the answer? It's quite straightforward, right? I need to, so I'm assuming that SY is strictly positive, right? Otherwise, I have a solution G equals zero. Uh, so if it is strictly positive, I will just divide divide by it, right? 
Again, remember, I'm doing this for every frequency psi. And this is what I get. So my optimal G that I'm, I'm denoting as G star, but star downstairs, otherwise it will be interpreted as complex conjugate. So usually optimal solutions are, are interpreted with, uh, are written with a star. So this is my optimal, again, remember L2 optimal. I, I, I selected the L2 error, the MSE, uh, the Euclidean error squared. As, uh, as my optimality criterion. So I have a cl nice closed form expression for this G, which looks like SFY, the cross spectrum, over SY, the spectrum of the, of the measurement. Okay, and, and this, uh, this form of an optimal system to do the inverse operator, it's called the Wiener filter. Okay? Any questions? I'm sure that the, the electrical engineers here have seen this at least once. So I'm not telling you anything new. Uh, and well, unfortunately, the Wiener filter is not such a useful construction in, in, uh, uh, in image processing. Because, it, because the use of the L2 distance is very harmful for images. It, it produces blurred results. Okay? So, so it, it, is, it is, of course, it is a pragmatic choice because we know how to, we, we, we know how to work with the Euclidean distance. Actually, it, it results in uh, uh, nice closed form expressions, as you can see here, but unfortunately, it is, it is not very useful. So, we can still use the L2 distance, but we'll need a better prior on our, on our images. Or we can do some, some different distance, okay? So, basically, remember that well, I will show it to you later, but when you use L2 distance, we, we, we make some assumption about the nature of our noise, that is, that we assume it is white and Gaussian. And we know that this is not the case, right? We have seen that, that uh, noise in imaging is much more complicated. And we, uh, then we can, of course, do some variance stabilizing transformation, but then the linearity of this convolution model for in the forward model will be, will be destroyed. Okay, so it is never, never perfectly accurate. So let's see, let's have a look at the estimation error itself. Basically, this was our expression for the MSE. I dropped that exponential at, uh, at x equal, equals zero. So let's just substitute our filter inside. This is our optimal system, right? Let's spell it out. This is what I'm going to get, okay? And I can define this quantity, I can define, let me call it rho psi, it will be the cross spectrum of Fy at point psi over the square root of the spectra of y and f at the same point. So then I can write this integral in this way, it will be the spectrum of f, of my latent signal, times 1 minus rho psi rho complex conjugate psi d psi. Okay? So I, I'm using this. Uh, I'm using this raw because it resemble. It really resembles the correlation coefficient, right? So think of it as some form of correlation coefficient per frequency, and you see the error is obviously governed by the amount of energy we have uh, at a particular frequency in the latent signal itself, right? If we have ten times more energy, the error will be, will grow ten tenfold, right? This is obvious because the error is relative to the to the content, to the energy content of the of the original signal uh, itself, but it will be multiplied by this factor that is written here, which is my one minus the square of the correlation coefficient. And this, this correlation coefficient, if it is close to one or minus one, then we are going to uh, then we are going to get a very strong attenuation of the error here. Okay, so basically at those frequencies where f and y are correlated in this sense, in the sense that rho is close, is close to one, we are going to get small uh, uh, energy density of the, of, of the error, okay? And actually, if you, if you go back to, to my example of linear estimation with just random vectors and, and matrices, you're going to get the same expression as well. It, the error will also look like this. Okay, so let I don't see why I have this. So one one more thing that I wanted I wanted to show to you. Uh, let's have a closer look 
at our estimated uh, uh, at our estimated signal and the resulting error signal. So this is my f hat that I'm estimating. This is its cross spectrum with the measurement y. Okay. It is just given by g star times s y. Okay. So I'm substituting what is written here. This is g star, right? This is what we got from the solution of our optimization problem. We call it Wiener filter, right? So this is my this is my cross spectrum. Of course, I can cancel this out. Okay. So I just get the cross spectrum of f, the latent signal, with a measurement y. I'm assuming that I know this quantity. Okay. So let's go, let's do the inverse Fourier transform. So if the spectrum, the cross spectrum of f hat and y equals the cross spectrum of f and y, then the cross correlation function of f hat and y will be the cross correlation function of f and y, right? Obviously, because this is just uh, the, the, they are related by the Fourier transform. Okay. So let's see the cross correlation of of e my error signal and y. So let's write it like this. This is the cross correlation of f minus f hat with y, which is the cross correlation of f with y minus the cross correlation of f hat with y. Okay? And obviously, because of this result, the difference is zero. Okay? Now, I remember I told you that I can interpret uh, I can interpret this quantity as a form of an inner product between x and y. Well, I, I need to actually to, to work a little bit to define all the technical details, but I can think of random processes x and y as vectors in some space which now receives a geometry once I, I define an inner product, right? Because then I can define a norm of x as... Uh, basically as the uh, inner product square, right? So then I can measure distances and angles in the in that space. So it becomes it, it becomes a geometry, and this geometry is isomorphic to the Euclidean geometry because this is this this is the standard way of defining Euclidean geometry in in any space, right? Defining this kind of an inner product. So basically, what happens when I tell you that the inner product between two vectors is zero? How do we call this situation? We say that x is orthogonal to y, okay, in the in a Euclidean space. So here, again, by hand waving, I'm saying that I defined an inner product in terms of the of the cross correlation function, and where we see that this function is identically zero. So I can I can call this uh, the error signal is orthogonal to y, okay. And I, I claim, and this is something that I will now illustrate uh, to you with a picture, that that orthogonality of the error is simply synonymous to L2 optimality. Okay, so let me let me show it to you uh, with this with this uh, illustration. So th this green uh, this green uh, vector f is my signal. It resides in some in some very big space, well, infinitely dimensional space to be to be precise. And I would like to estimate it. Okay, and I would like to estimate it on a subspace of vectors, and this subspace of vectors is anything that has the form of g convolution with y. Okay, so my estimator cannot be lifted from that subspace because this is this is the form of the estimator that I uh, that I selected. Okay, now let's suppose I have this estimator f hat, this vector here, and I'm measuring the error signal, this e. That is uh, that is uh, drawn here in in blue. The length of this vector is is the MSE is my estimation error. Okay, and now I, I I'm asking you which vector in this subspace which f hat will minimize the MSE. Okay, and well in Euclidean geometry we obviously know the one that will form a right angle with with the error right. Otherwise the error will not be shortest. So in order to get the shortest error, I need to make this angle right. Okay? And this is exactly what is meant by orthogonality. The error signal is orthogonal to the subspace of my estimators. If it is not orthogonal, I can I can improve my estimator in the in the L2 sense. Okay, I can shorten this error vector. 
So basically, instead of demanding uh, L2 optimality, I could demand orthogonality. I would get exactly the same result. So I could, I could derive the Wiener filter by demanding orthogonality. Okay? This is basically the, the hallmark property of being, uh, being optimal in the Euclidean sense. Any questions? Okay, so let's just see a very simple example when, when it, so basically our derivation of the Wiener filter was completely general. We didn't make any particular assumptions ab about our forward model, except that uh, when a, a, a wide sun stationary signal goes in, a wide sun stationary signal goes out, and the input and the output are also jointly WSS. Okay, so that was our assumption. Otherwise, we could not we could not write spectra and cross spectra. So basically, it means that that it had uh, uh, translation equivariant properties. But the forward model can be completely crazy and and absolutely nonlinear, right? Uh, let's assume now this particular form of the forward model, where we have convolution with some known uh, kernel H. I'm assuming that F is WSS. The noise, the additive noise that is contaminating the measurement is independent, so it's statistically independent uh, at zero mean, it's statistically independent on F, of course. So it, do, it, it doesn't relate to F statistically. And uh, it is IAD. Okay, so IAD noise necessarily means that it is white, right? So then, so then I can write, uh, I can write SY, I can write SY as H power response times SF, right? This is what happens to the, to the, um, to the spectrum of F when it passes through a, a, a linear translation equivariant system, plus SN. The cross terms between F and N will disappear because of this assumption of zero mean and statistical independence, okay? So this is, this is the spectrum that I'm going to have. And uh, I can write the, the autocorrelation function at point tau of the measurement y. This is just uh, the autocorrelation by definition, right? It is a WSS signal, so it's a function of a single argument. And of course, I can open these, ex open, basically, open these parentheses, right? The products push the expectation in as we did, and uh, I'm going to have the sum of these uh, four terms, right? And again, as I said, this term and this term is going to disappear, right? Because of assumption of zero mean and statistical independence. So I'm left with this. And therefore, I have this result in, in, in the frequency domain, okay? So this is my forward model. Okay, so again, in the space, domain and in the frequency domain. Is N something that we know? So I don't, I, I don't have a measurement of N, but I know it's statistics. So I assume that I know it's statistics, right? So I'm assuming that it is independent of the signal, which we know is not true in imaging, right? Because the variance, for example, does depend on the, on the, on the signal itself. If we do a, a variance stabilizing transformation, then we can assume the, uh, the additive uh, I, I additive IAD noise model, but then the convolution will will become nonlinear, right? So I'm assuming something that doesn't really happen in imaging. That this is this is. By the way, there are tons of papers that work with this model, and it's simply incorrect. So it can give something, but it, this something will never be uh, never be uh, totally accurate. So we need to be more careful modeling our noise, modeling our uh, our forward model. And I will show you a slightly more sophisticated framework to do it to do it right. Okay, so so let's write the cross correlation between f and y, and the resulting spectrum. Of course, this is just the dependence between between the input and the output of a, a, a linear time equivariant system. We did it zillion of, a zillion of times. H complex conjugate will pop up in the spectrum, right? It will color the spectrum of the input, okay? And then we have the Wiener filter. We need these two quantities to, uh, to derive the Wiener filter. The Wiener filter will look like this. 
let's just substitute the expressions, we have h star sf in the numerator and h absolute value squared times sf plus sn in the numerator, in the denominator, sorry. Okay? So let's do a slightly, slightly, uh, a slight rearrangement of these, of these, uh, of these expressions. So remember that I can always divide the numerator and the denominator by sn. Okay, I'm assuming that it never vanishes. If it vanishes, then at, th at that point I can, I can, I can treat the original expression. So I will define this quantity, which is typically called the signal-to-noise ratio. So it's the power of the signal over the power of the noise at a given frequency. So it's, it's let's call it SNR density, if you will. Okay, so it's, it's the signal-to-noise ratio at a, a certain frequency. So it's per unit of frequency. Okay, so let's write it this way. It will be H star times the SNR and H, H star times the SNR plus one. Okay, so it's exactly the same expression, but I like to see it in this form of SNR. Now, let's look at two limit cases. When the SNR is very big, when we have overwhelmingly more signal than noise at a given frequency. So what happens is that this one becomes insignificant, right? And then I can write it as H star times SNR over H, H star times SNR. So what do I get after I cancel uh, the numerator and the denominator terms? I get 1 over h, right? And Well, this is the naive solution. Where I, I, I told you that this naive solution will be ruined by noise, but if we, don't have, uh, if we have enough signal and little noise, this is a good solution, right? So I, again, this is per frequency. So those frequencies where I have very good SNR, 1 over h is a good solution. I simply couldn't do it blindly. Now, if the SNR is close to zero, it means that I have more noise than signal. So then, basically, uh, this one will become dominant in the denominator, but I'm multiplying by a, a quantity close to zero in the numerator. So what is the answer? Zero, right? So again, at those frequencies where the signal-to-noise ratio is high, I'm simply taking the inverse. At those frequencies where the signal is low, or when the SNR is low, I'm attenuating the response. So I'm, I don't want to pass too much noise. So the system gives very strong attenuation, cl close to zero. So I can think of this as some form of regularized inverse of my h. So I'm not just blindly multiplying by h inverse. I'm examining which frequencies I can actually pass through h inverse and which I should not. And of course, in the situation in between here, there is some milder attenuation if I have lower SN the, the lower is the SNR, the bigger is the attenuation of g. Okay? So this is what essentially Wiener filter does. It regularizes my inverse. Okay? Question? Yes. Yes, yes. So, 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 so for the Wiener filter, so how do I know the SNR? For the Wiener, Wiener filter, I need this quantity, these two quantities, right? So in this specific example of the forward model, uh, it amounts to knowing SF and knowing SN. So I don't know F, but I know its spectrum. Sometimes this is a reasonable assumption, sometimes it, it is out of question, but suppose I... I will need any, so in any inverse problem, if I cannot model my latent signal, if I cannot tell you anything about the signal, the, the chances of being able to faithfully estimate it are zero, right? So you need to know something about your signal. So here I'm assuming that you know it's second order statistics, right? And the fact that it is stationary. You need to know the and you also need to know the noise, right? This is basically the cross statistics amount to knowing the noise. Okay, so if you know b both quantities, the way we are going to formulate it uh, next is by saying that I have a prior on my signal. Okay, and of course, of course, I have the knowledge of my of my forward model. I, I know I know the nature of noise. I can measure it in the lab. I can I can model it from some theoretical principles, right? So if you don't know the forward model, it's very difficult to solve an inverse problem. So you know the the forward model. You don't have an observation of the latent signal, but you you can uh, you can 
tell me something about its uh, statistics. Okay, and from that you can do this estimation. Okay, any questions? Okay, let's do let's do another exercise. So we have this forward model. Again, the, the most general setting you can you can imagine, and let's let's define the conditional distribution of y given f. Okay, so if I now ag again and I asked you to uh, to read the uh, short write up, uh, write up that I prepared for you on the course uh, website, um, talking about elementary notions and probability and, and statistics, one of these notions uh, are conditional expectations and conditional distributions. Okay, so just have a look. Uh, I tried to define it rigorously, but without uh, without too much rigor. Um, so, if I give you f, so f is a stochastic quantity, but now suppose I measured it for you and I gave it to you. So, the only stochastic quantity that remains now is n, right? In the forward model. So if I give you f, how is y distributed? It is distributed like n, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, y is simply noise plus this offset. But this offset is a deterministic quantity because I gave you f, right? So if I give you f, the, basically the distribution of the, uh, so it is called conditional distribution uh, of y given f, is exactly the distribution of, of the noise of n. Okay, so I can write it like this. So the, I'm writing p, but if you prefer, we can work with density functions. Okay? Or, or it can be in terms of CDF or PDF, doesn't matter. It can be any, any, uh, any function that defines the, 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 the probability law of this stochastic, uh, stochastic uh, uh, quantity. So the, again, the, the conditional distribution of y given f is simply the distribution of n at the point y minus hf. And again, remember, I'm giving you f. I'm giving you a, a, a realization of f. Okay. So if I assume that my noise is IID, what is particular about statistical independence? How does it manifest itself in the probability distribution? So independence, in terms of the PDF or the CDF, doesn't matter, uh, means that I can write uh, the joint distribution as the product of the marginals, right? I can write it as a tensor product of one-dimensional uh, probability distributions, okay? So basically, I can take this product point-wise. It's, sli it's slightly more complicated when I'm talking about y, which is a function. It is a function, it has a continuous argument, but if you think of this as a discrete domain signal, then obviously it will be just a product for every sample, right? Now, I can think of it differently. So suppose if I gave you f, so if I gave you f, so just think of this, of this notation here as a, as a funny decoration. Okay, so what it defines really is just another family of distributions. Let's call it Q. It will be, it will be parameterized by this F. So the moment I give you a realization of F, lowercase f that I'm writing here, you just get a new probability distribution of Y. Okay? And let's call it QY with the parameter F because every F will give you a different distribution. Okay? So... I'm treating now f as a parameter, as a deterministic quantity. I don't care about its, uh, about its stochastic nature. I gave you f, this is my latent signal, and as a result, you get some distribution for the measurement y. Okay? And I'm calling it q. So again, we have some ground truth signal, f, and it is distributed according to this distribution qf. Okay? Now let me hypothesize a, ground, a, a signal f hat. This is my estimate. Okay, so every estimate that I give you will create another distribution q f hat. Okay, so you have the data. This is your data. These are these are the measurements that you that you uh, collected, and you don't know this distribution, but you can construct this distribution. Okay. And now I would like to define my optimal estimator as the one 
that minimizes the distance between QF and QF hat. Some distance between two distributions. Okay, some some disagreement between these two distributions. My data came from some ground truth distribution that for for a moment I will assume I know it, but of course I don't know it because if I knew it I, I would know F. Uh, but I can I can do statistical fitting, right? I have some data that I collected. Let's find the distribution that describes this data. Okay, makes sense? Okay, let's continue. Uh, I hope the, the rational until now is is clear. So again, let me just recap. We have some distribution that uh, created our data. So I can I can think of this distribution as a distribution from the family of distributions that admit this form. Okay, so it's a it's a parametric family of distribution. Uh, when I substitute f equal to the actual latent signal, I get the I, I get the exact distribution of of my data. However, I don't have access to that distribution. This is something that I would like to estimate. I would like to estimate this parameter. Uh, but I do have the, the data that I sampled from that, from that distribution. These are my observations why. And based on that, I would like to estimate my, uh, my signal. Okay? And again, pay attention that here f hat, my latent signal f, is just treated as a parameter. I'm not assuming any distribution of f. It's, it's a deterministic quantity. It's a parameter. So again, I would like to minimize this disagreement between my hypothesized distribution, because I'm making a hypothesis about f, and therefore uh, I have conse the con consequentially I have the, the the hypothesis about the distribution of my data, and I would like to minimize the discrepancy between this distribution and the ground truth one. Okay, so here D denotes some uh, discrepancy, some divergence, some disagreement between two probability distributions. Okay, and the standard way of measuring uh, the disagreement between two distributions is called the Kullback library divergence. Okay, so let's just define it. Let's have I two. I have two probability measures P and Q. Okay. I will denote them in two colors, red, uh, the red distribution and the blue distribution. So I would like to measure the dis disagreement between P and Q. So I will define what is called the Kullback library divergence between P and Q. It is denoted with these double bars here. And it will be given as uh, the integral with respect to the measure P of log dP over dQ. So now what is this quantity? What is dP over dQ? So if we want to be completely rigorous, this quantity is known uh, is known as the Radon, Radon Nicodym derivative. Okay, so, and I'm sure you know what Radon Nicodym derivative is. So I'm I'm sure you know what it is, but let's uh, let me ignore let me ignore some simple uh, technical assumptions. I will just say that when when uh, when the f basically when when uh, these technical conditions happen suppose i have two probability measures or actually any measures mu and lambda and then i can say that there exists a function f f is a function that i that i write as d mu as d lambda and i call it the radonico dim derivative such that the the measure of a set A is given as the integral of A d lambda, so it's the integral with respect to the measure lambda of f. Okay, I know how to integrate a function with respect to a measure, right? So now, uh, this seems completely abstract, but now suppose lambda is a uniform measure, what is called the Lebesgue measure, let's say on R. So this uniform measure t simply tells me the length of the interval, so lambda of an interval a, b is simply b minus a. Okay? This is, this is what is called the uniform measure. Right? This is the standard measure with respect to, we, uh, with respect to which you always integrate in R without maybe s s thinking of it this way. Now, so I can write now m a as the integral of a f x 
dx, right? So this is this is how we write integrals with respect to to the uniform measure. They, they are just Riemannian integrals. Now, how do we call this function? Now I'm thinking in terms of probability. How do we call this function f? So a is some event. It's the probability of some event. Mu is the probability measure. So what is the probability of an event a happening? It's the integral of this function f dx. How do we call f? The probability density function, right? So the probability density function is the radon nicotine derivative of our probability measure mu with respect to the standard uniform measure. Okay? So it has the it has the meaning of derivative. It tells us how one probability measure changes when we change the other measure. Okay? So th this is the meaning meaning of radon nicotine derivative. We have it here. And if you want to write it in terms of probability densities, so if P and Q have PDFs p and q lowercase, I can simply write it like this, okay? So this quantity is called the Kullback library divergence of p and q. I can think of it as, as the expectation of, of the log. It's the expectation of the log of p over q. It's the, uh, the, the difference of the logarithms of p and q when the expectation is taken over the measure p. Now pay attention that this definition is not symmetric. If, you, if we swap the roles of P and Q, the result will be different. So it's not a distance. It's not a metric. It's not a distance. It's not symmetric. But it, of course, it can be symmetrized. But it, it, that's why it is called divergence and not distance. It's not, it's not a distance. OK? So this is a standard way of measuring the amount of disagreement between two probability distributions. OK? So let's adopt this disagreement for our problem. Basically, we had this problem. Remember, we want to minimize the disagreement between some ground truth distribution of the data and our hypothesized distribution. And we, of course, assume that these distributions have a certain form that come from the conditional distribution that we asserted of y given f. Okay? So let's just evaluate this uh, kullback library divergence between our QF and QF hat. Okay, so it will be the expectation. I, I like to think of it as the ex expectation of the log of the ratio of the two of the two density functions. So I'm 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 sloppy here. I'm writing Q capital, and I'm thinking of it as as a as a as a PDF. Otherwise, I I would I would have written the Radon Nikodim derivative. Okay, but let let me be less formal here. So I'm taking the expectation of y that is distributed according to QF, right? And uh, the expectation is of this log QF over QF hat. Okay? So I can write this. I should have written parentheses here, of course. It's the, it's the expectation of the difference of log F. Oh, no, no, sorry. It's, no, it's okay here. It's basically, it's one expectation minus the other expectation. Okay? So it's the expectation of log QF over QF and the expectation of log QF hat over QF, okay? So remember, we would like to minimize this quantity over F hat. Now, what can you tell me about the first term? It, it doesn't depend on F hat, right? It's constant. We, we can call this the entropy of this distribution, right? This, this is what, what in probability theory is called the, the entropy. And it's, it is constant. We, we don't care about it because it doesn't depend on our optimization variable, right? So what we really care about minimizing is minimize the expectation over QF of minus log QF hat, okay? And let's substitute the form that we assumed for, for this distribution. Instead of QF, I'm going to write this ground truth distribution, the conditional distribution of y given f with the true f substituted here. Okay? And here in the log it will be qf hat. So I'm substituting my f hat. And f hat is my optimization variable. Okay? And I would like to minimize this expected minus log with respect to f hat. Make sense? So we just substituted the kullback library divergence into our general form of the optimal estimator. Okay? 
so now, well, well, so the problem is that I don't really have access to this distribution, right? It is latent. I don't know f, therefore I don't know this distribution. But I can approximate it by by a finite sample. So what I will uh, what I will assume I will assume that I'm fixing some set of spatial locations x1 to xn, and I'm sampling my observation on those locations. Otherwise, I need to to deal with functions of a continuous variable. So let's either assume that our signal is in in uh, in the discrete domain or we just sampled our continuous domain signal so i have a finite sample of locations from which i measure my signal so let's say i'm measuring the pixels of my image this is already a, a, a finite set of locations right and what i'm given as the input my data are this vector y which is the realization of this random vector okay so this is an n-dimensional random vector Okay, and what I have as y lowercase, this is what I'm actually given, is the realization of this vector. Okay, obviously it belongs to this py. It is distributed according to py. So let's now take our log uh, probability of this random vector y. Uh, so these are our data. These are our observations with the hypothesized parameter f hat okay this what this was the objective that the expectation of which we had to minimize in our uh, in our minimization problem okay so now we know how uh, let's substitute our forward model remember our forward model was y equals some operator h acting on f plus n okay so once uh, I give you f, so basically I'm giving you f, this is my parameter f hat, right? So it's n, okay, it's n. So basically my y is this, my y minus hf is distributed as my noise, right? So I will write my data, y1 minus h acting on f hat sampled at point x1, and the same for the rest of the points, okay? And if I assume my noise is IID, I can split this joint, n-dimensional joint uh, distribution into the product of one-dimensional distributions of a single sample of the noise. Okay? And of course, the log of the product becomes the sum of the logs. Okay? So here I have this sum from, one to, uh, from I going to, from 1 to n of these yi minus h f hat at point xi. Okay, and basically, this this quantity, this function, embodies my knowledge of the forward model, and of course, this operator here as well. I must know them because otherwise, I cannot I cannot model the forward model. Okay. Any questions? So let's take let's normalize it by one over n and take take the minus remember we want the negative log the expectation of the negative log so i will take minus one over n uh, the log of this joint uh, uh, joint probability which is one over n of the sum of the negative logarithms and i will call this function or this is how it is called in statistics the negative log likelihood function okay now pay attention that we have independent uh, independent noise here. I have 1 over n of this sum. It looks like an empirical estimation of the mean, right? So it's, it's, it's an average, which by... It is a, it is a stochastic quantity. If, if, if I substitute different realizations of y, I will get, get a different quantity, right? But what can you tell me about the variance of this stochastic quantity as a function of n? What log governs uh, empirical estimates of, of 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 a mean? Basically, what happens to to an average when I I, I do average on a very big sample? 
it, it approaches, it basically it concentrates around around the true mean, right? It, it is called the law of large numbers. There are different uh, theorems that embody this law, but it basically it tells, tells that this is an unbiased estimator and its variance goes to zero when the sample grows to infinity. Okay, so if I grow my sample, what I get is actually the true expectation. And the true expectation will be, of course, over the distribution of my data, which I don't know, right? So in this sense, I'm doing a finite sample approximation of this expectation, right? So if I had a an infinite sample, I would minimize this quantity. But otherwise, I, I need to minimize some empirical average that approximates this quantity. Okay, and actually, I, if I if I if if I do a, a sufficiently meticulous job, I can actually tell you how big the sample needs to be in order for me to achieve a certain uh, uh, a certain accuracy with a certain probability. Right? I can write some kind of a tail bound on on the on the quality of this of this estimate. Okay, so again, we have this estimator. It simply amounts to minimization of. Uh, of this expectation, which I don't really have in practice, but I can do a finite sample approximation of this quantity. Okay, and this finite sample approximation is exactly our negative log likelihood that we constructed. Okay, so let's just write it explicitly. It is the arg minimum of this joint distribution, negative normalized by n, and of course, we can write it as a sum. So basically, this is a sum, one, one over n, i from one to n, log p y given f of y i given f hat. And we could write it explicitly in terms of, of the distribution of the noise, okay? So this estimator that minimizes this quantity is called the maximum li likelihood uh, estimator. So basically, remember we started we started from uh, asserting parametric families of distributions. We wanted to minimize the discrepancy between these distributions. We used the Kullback library divergence to estimate this discrepancy, and we obtained that. Uh, well, not so surprisingly, this amounted to maximizing this conditional probability of y given f. So basically. I would like to maximize this conditional probability, which in the statistical uh, parlance is called the likelihood of y given f over all possible f's. Okay? So I would like to find the likelihood, this conditional distribution of f, uh, of y, of basically the data that I actually observed, tell me which parameter f I have to substitute here in order to maximize the probability of the data that I actually observed. Okay, so you have your data, and now you fit your you fit the distribution that describes them the best. Okay, out of the family of these distributions, this is what maximum likelihood does. Okay, so let's just have a look at our uh, toy example of non-blind deconvolution with additive noise. So I'm assuming n, z uh, uh, n to be zero mean white Gaussian noise. Okay, so minus log pn, now I need to have an explicit form for the probability distribution. For a Gaussian noise, I'm just ignoring details, but if you take the, the, the Gaussian, it is a, an exponential multiplied by some normalization constant. Uh, that normalization constant comes here. It, it's a negative exponential, I'm taking, taking minus log. So what, what will remain from the exponential will be n squared. So there is no bias because it's zero mean, right? Over twice sigma n squared. And sigma n squared is the variance of my noise, the variance of a single sample. This is a white noise. It will have a flat uh, white spectrum in the free domain, right? So this is, this is my model for the noise. So I substitute it here, okay? I substitute it here in this expression that I have for the negative likelihood. And it will simply amount to this Euclidean distance. Okay, so you see that it's the square of the difference normalized by, by n and normalized by the sigma squared. Okay? So this is my, this is my uh, likelihood function. So let's write it in a slightly funny form. If I assume that n goes to infinity, instead of writing this sum, I will write an integral. It will be an integral of yx minus h convolution 
with f hat at x dx, plus some constant about which I don't care. Okay, so let me just drop this constant, or at least this is true up to a constant. Okay, I can think of this as just the Euclidean norm, the L squared norm between y and h convolution with f hat. f hat is my parameter, remember. Y is my data. Uh, I can use Percival's identity to write this norm in the Fourier domain. Okay, so in the Fourier domain, convolution will become pointwise product with capital H, the frequency response of my forward model, of my, of my system with which I do convolution in the forward model. So let me write this explicitly in the Fourier domain. This is my L2 norm. Okay. And I would like to minimize this. Okay, so remember, maximizing the likelihood is minimizing the, no the negative log likelihood, right? So I would like to minimize this. I would like to minimize this over f, which now amounts to the Fourier transform of f. Okay? Again, I'm treating f as a deterministic quantity. Okay? And the obvious result I get for every frequency is f hat is y over h. Not very surprising, right? So essentially my estimator is just the inverse of h. So we worked so hard and we got this this unusable result. This is a very bad idea to, to estimate my signal in this way. Okay? So wh wh why, why did it happen? Of the noise? Well, it was a reasonable assumption. I mean, in the, in, the, in the Wiener filter setting, we assumed exactly the same assumption about the noise. Well, we didn't assume it was Gaussian, but that doesn't matter. When we model it using its second-order moment, we are essentially thinking of it as something fully determined by the second-order moment, which, which is true for Gaussian processes. But the, the point here is that we made no assumption about how Y actually looks like. There was no... We... we, we, we not Y, sorry. We didn't make any assumption of how f looks like. We treated f as something deterministic. It was just a parameter. So it could take any form, right? It could be anything crazy. So if I now give you this estimate, f will be truly bad, right? Because it will be, um, uh, this inverse will be amplifying noise. But I'm not penalizing your solution for anything that doesn't look like a real image. I have no as assumption of how f should look like which class of functions it should come from, okay? So th this is the problem in, in maximum likelihood estimators. We don't, we don't have any place where we can assume anything about the nature of our f, about our latent signal. So let's upgrade this estimator. Let's try to inject our knowledge about, uh, about how f should look like. So again, in ML, we had to maximize this conditional probability. This is the conditional probability of uh, um, this is the conditional probability of our data given our hypothesis. Okay, and this hypothesis f hat was treated as just a deterministic parameter. Okay, so let let me now treat f hat as a stochastic quantity. So if I treat it as, as a stochastic quantity, I can I can say something about its distribution, for example. And now let's maximize the conditional probability of f, of f hat, okay, let's write it as a stochastic quantity, given the data. Okay, so again, instead of, it looks, it's look, it looks the same, but instead of working with y given f, I would now like to switch to f given y. Okay? So I, I would like to maximize the conditional probability of the quantity I'm estimating, which is f, given the data. And before, I wanted to maximize the probability of the data given my parameter f. Okay, so now f is not a parameter. It's, it's a stochastic quantity. Now, what is the relation between the distribution of this and the distribution of this? Well, probably this is one of the most useful and known uh, theorems in, in probability theory and in statistics, it's called the Bayes theorem, right? So it simply tells me that uh, the probability of f, the distribution of f given y, 
is the probability of y given f times this, again, radon nicotine derivative, dpf over dpy. And if you don't like this derivative, you can write it in terms of densities as the density of f given y equals to the density of y given f normalized by uh, the ratio of pf over py. Okay? And this is called the Bayes theorem. So in, in, the, in this Bayesian uh, jargon, we so th again, this is I'm stating this theorem in terms of densities. So we call we think of F as a hypothesis. So we are hypothesizing some explanation of our of our world of our data, and this hypothesis has a probability. It is now a stochastic quantity. It is distributed with this probability. Uh, the our knowledge of its probability distribution will be affected by what the Bayes Bayesian parallels uh, calls evidence, which is our data, y. Okay? So, before I observed any data, which I can fancily say a priori, a priori, before making any measurement, I had some knowledge about what f looks like. Okay? So this is my prior distribution of f before observing the evidence. Okay? So this is called the prior. And, of course, this is called the evidence. Y is called the evidence. Okay? Now, I have this quantity, P, Y, given F. We already gave it a name. It is called the likelihood of observing evidence Y, given F. And what I really care about is what is called the posterior distribution, the a posteriori distribution. A posteriori means after I have observed Y. So after I observed Y, I will probably update my, uh, my knowledge about the probability of my hypothesis. Okay? So I have some knowledge of the hypothesis before observing data. That was my prior. And then I have the posterior. This is what I should use once I uh, observed some measurement. Okay? So this is, this is our terminology. Now, we are maximizing the posterior distribution of f given y. And the resulting estimator is known as a maximum a posterior estimator or MAP. Okay, let's substitute, let's substitute this in terms of the Bayes theorem. And I will be sloppy here. So basically, this is the likelihood. This is the prior. This is the evidence, right? So let's just write it in terms of densities. It will be the arg minimum of the first term, which is, oh, sorry, the, the first term, the second term that comes from the from the uh, numerator here, and the second term that comes from the denominator. So again, I took the negative log, and I transformed a maximization problem into a minimization problem. And again, the argument, the optimization variable in this in this setting is f hat. The same same story I had with maximum likelihood, but now instead of maximizing the likelihood, I'm maximizing the posterior. Okay, so apparently it's it, it's just a minor retouch of the problem. So what we have here, first of all, the third term, just pay attention, it is constant in our optimization variable. So it will not affect our problem. The, f the first term is just our good old negative log likelihood that we minimized before, right? The second term is the prior. And this term exactly embodies our knowledge about what a an image should look like, right? Because this is the distribution of f without observing any data. So our, uh, our final estimator looks like this. We have our likelihood minus log probability of the prior. Okay, so it, think of it as an upgraded version of the ML estimator. In ML estimator, we just had the first term, and we didn't assume any prior. Actually, it's not true. We did assume a prior. What, which prior did we assume on F? A uniform distribution, right? So a uniform distribution will give us a constant, a constant prior term, which arguably is a horrible assumption. And a natural image is not a uniformly distributed noise, right? So we, we made this assumption. Therefore, we, we had so, such, such nonsensical uh, answers regarding our estimation problem in the, the convolution example, for example. So the, the better we, we can model this term, the better will be our ability to solve inverse problems, right? So let's let's assume let's make 
again, this is a toy assumption, but I will show you how we can get more meaningful results than just H inverse in our map deconvolution problem. You will see some more examples in the tutorial today. So I'm assuming my noise model as before. This is just wide, white Gaussian additive noise with some, some variance Sn squared. Okay, and let's assume some. So basically, the, and this was my, my this was my maximum likelihood estimate, right? This is what we did before. So let's now inject some prior for f, and this will be a very naive prior. I will assume that some derivative. I don't. I I, I want to be specific. Some derivative that I call here by partial partial f. Uh, let's say the first derivative, or maybe a set of derivatives of, of, of a certain order, I'm assume, assuming that these derivatives are also white Gaussian. Okay, so in, in, in a natural image, uh, a very important part of an image are the edges, are the transitions between one object to another. And basically, I'm assuming that the derivative is behaving like a Gaussian noise, which is very distant from, from the way it actually behaves. It actually has a very long tail distribution because there are edges that occupy a small number of pixels in the image, and there the gradient is very strong. And for the rest of the image, the derivatives are not as strong, and basically they form these long tails. So I, I will, I'm assuming a much shorter tail distribution, which is the Gaussian distribution. I will show you in a few weeks that if we make this uh, super Gaussian assumption, something that looks like uh, a smaller power than the square in the exponential will get uh, a prior that assumes sparsity of the of the derivatives, and this will be a very powerful prior. But l let me assume this very simple prior because it just gives me a, another L two term. the The super Gaussian assumption will give me something that looks like L one. Okay, and this will be a more complicated optimization problem. But l again, I'm assuming this completely unrealistic and and uh, useless term in image processing just for, for the sake of visualization. Then we'll upgrade it into something something better. So if I'm assuming this prior, I'm going to add this term to my estimator. Okay, so this is my negative log prior probability. Okay? So let's just rearrange the term in this integration. I'm I would like to first of all write it in the frequency domain using Percival's identity because I'm dealing with L2 norms, I can always do it. And you, you see that my integrands here can be split per frequency. So I can minimize these, these quantities per frequency. But now my optimization variable appears here and here. Both in the, uh, this is called, the first term is called the data fitting term. So it, it measures how well, how faithful I am, to, I am to my measurements. The second term, is the prior term. It tells us how faithful I am to my modeling assumption of my of my signal. Okay. So remember, in that in that case of, of inverting this deconvolution, if I want to be completely faithful to my data, I will just take H inverse. But that might give me a result that is very unfaithful to the prior. So I have some trade-off between the data term and the prior, and the relative strength of the data term and the prior is, de is determined by the ratio of these two sigmas. Basically, my SNR, if you will. Okay. So per frequency, I will drop the frequency argument psi. I have this term. I already normalized by by. Uh, so basically, I multiplied everything by sigma and squared, and I removed the two. I can write it this way. Okay. So I just open the square, and I pushed everything that depends on h squared here and d squared into a single expression and basically it multiplies f squared, f squared hat. Okay? Now, I would like to minimize this with respect to f hat. So I just need to take the derivative of this expression, the gradient of this expression with respect to f and, uh, uh, and demand this derivative to be zero. Now, the slight complication I have here is that this is a complex quantity, so I need to take derivatives of a complex quantity. Nothing really extraordinarily here. This is the final expression for the derivative. It really looks like the regular derivative. And consequently, I will have this closed form solution. Okay, so f hat will be, will be a 
some diagonal operator that is written here. Remember, we are working in frequency domain, so diagonal operator means that it will be convolution in the space domain. So this diagonal operating acting on my measurement y. So I have a solution that looks like Wiener filter. So my basically my inverse operator is convolution with some system g whose response is written here. Okay. So let's have a close look at this system g. It looks like this, right? So I have so if I didn't have this term, I would just have an inverse of h, right? So without without this term, I can simply cancel this and this and get, and get an inverse of h. But I have this second term. And let's again write this sigma n squared over sigma f squared as the as, as one over the SNR. Okay? So if the noise is much stronger, basically the sigma of the of the noise is much stronger than the sigma of this prior on f, I have I have a, a big number here, it means that I have a low SNR. So when the SNR is much bigger than 1, this quantity will be close to 0. 1 over the SNR will be close to 0, right? And then the second term will be negligible, and I'm going to get, I'm going to get 1 over h. Y so it's exactly the inverse that I was expecting. When the SNR is close to zero, this quantity will dominate the denominator, right? It's a non-negative quantity because, because of this square. So I'm going to get something close to zero. Okay? And again, you can think of this as a regularized inverse of H. So you see, by injecting some prior it's a completely unrealistic prior, but by injecting this prior, I already have this regularization effect. Okay. And what I'm what I'm going to to do next is essentially we are going to see a sequence of different ideas that lead to better priors on our f. So once you have a prior, you can plug it into your uh, into your optimization problem with your knowledge of the forward model. You can solve an inverse problem. Okay, so you need, of course, to to model the forward model faith, faithfully. If you have some deviation from from uh, between the model and, and and the reality, of course, this will harm you. But it is quite essential to uh, to make a good assumption about the prior, because this is what is going to allow you to recover a, a good quality image from some degraded uh, measurements. And the better is your prior the more degraded can, can be your measurements, or the less number of measurements you can take. And we, we're going to t talk about computational imaging, about compressed sensing in particular, in which we are going to see how our knowledge of the, of the uh, space of signals to which our signal of interest that we are measuring belongs will allow us to take much less samples that for, than, for example, Nyquist theory, would require us to take because our images are not just band limited actually they are not band limited uh, if we can do a better model for what our image looks like we can get uh, actually a perfect reconstruction with uh, with less measurements than w than uh, Nyquist uh, Nyquist uh, theorem would uh, would otherwise require okay so let's just let me just summarize the difference between between uh, ML and MAP. ML in ML we minimized the likelihood. In MAP we minimize the posterior. The posterior, uh, when we take the log, it looks like log likelihood plus log prior. Okay, and th this allowed us to inject our knowledge about our prior knowledge about about our signal. Now in the map estimator will estimate the posterior probability of our f hat given the data y. Okay? So essentially we care about estimating so this is a function this is a function of f, right? So this is a distribution of f. Let's say this is my distribution of f. This axis is f. And what I care is the maximum of this function. So I'm estimating the mode of this distribution. So maximum Maximum a posteriori, a posteriori estimation is uh, uh, is essentially 
trying to estimate the mode of the posterior probability distribution, the peak of the distribution. But now imagine that you have some crazy multi-model distribution with two peaks that look almost the same. That's looks like kind of unstable, right? If you if you try to find the peak, the peak might be unstable. You might be so. For, for example, if you have two almost equally high peaks, just a little bit of noise in your data can throw you from here to here. So how would you fix this problem? So working with some point-wise quantities is unstable. How can you how can you improve the, the estimate? So if point-wise is not good, you can smooth, right? You can take some some integral with respect to this distribution, right? And the integral with respect to the distribution is called an expectation. And this leads to what is called the Bayesian estimators. So we minimize the posterior expectation of some loss function. So I define some loss function that measures some point-wise disagreement between my true f and my hypothesized f. Okay? And I measure the expectation of this function with respect to this po posterior probability. So it's like integrating some loss function with respect to this probability distribution rather than finding its peak. And th of course this gives some smoothing effect and uh, it doesn't suffer from from the problems that uh, a pointwise quantity could suffer from. And actually our Wiener filter, if you, if you take a closer look at this, uh, it was a Bayesian estimator. We, we had this particular loss function that looked like the L2 norm, okay? And our estimator belonged to this family of functions. It was the convolution of G with Y. Okay, so Bayesian estimator obviously needs a prior. It needs the posterior distribution, and the posterior distribution is the likelihood plus the prior. Our prior was embodied in the form that we knew the cross statistics between F and Y. Okay, so that embodied our prior. And uh, actually, you can you can think of MAP as a particular case of Bayesian estimator with a, with a very uh, simple indicator function serving as the loss. Because you can get the probability uh, as the expectation of an indicator function, right? So basically, you can think of MAP as a particular case of, of Bayesian estimators. So depending on 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 your on your application and and the technical complexity of of doing map or doing bayesian estimator you can choose one of these approaches they are different but both allow to embody your knowledge of the of the prior of the signal rather than just making some uh, nonsensical uniform assumptions okay so so what again what i'm going to do next i'm going to show you more meaningful priors than the two examples we have seen until now. So this was just setting the framework, and within this framework, we are now going to concentrate on this. Sorry, on, on, on the prior term, right? So let me just write it here. We, we, we had our estimator, we wanted to minimize L minus log pf, right? We wanted to minimize it with respect to f hat. So uh, from now on I'm going to concentrate on how to model this. So our, all our knowledge and understanding of how images look like, all empirical observations and maybe some theoretical modeling will go into defining this term. Okay? So that's why I uh, I insisted on spending some some non-trivial amount of your time by laying laying out this framework. Okay. Well, if you have any questions, let's let's discuss them now because we have some time. Okay. So 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 first of all, so you're talking now about about the Bayesian setting, and and the question is what what, what is a better loss function than than L two? We will see that. Uh, we can still stay with the L2 uh, function if we do a better prior, if we put a better prior. And that better prior can be very complicated. It can be, we will see, for example, priors that are based on similarity between small patches in an image. We'll see priors that are uh, based on some notion of sparsity in a, in, in a certain domain, basically a sparse representation in some, some dictionary. We can make it, instead of working with patches, we can make it shift invariant. We are still 
going to use typically the L2 distance. There are other ways of defining distances that, are, that is more meaningful. You can define L2 distance on not on the image itself, but on something else, for example, on its gradients or some, some more complicated features that will be, for example, uh, uh, more stable under changes of illumination and things like that. Uh, or you can actually learn this function and basically we'll see the connection between between sparsity and our axiomatic models that we are going to uh, to build to to the data driven approaches such as deep neural networks for example convolutional neural networks so we see an explicit connection between between uh, between uh, the priors or some class of priors that we are going to construct to to, to cnns this will, will be will be actually i think an elegant connection uh, and then, we'll, then I will show you, so basically our approach to solving an inverse problem looks like an optimization problem, right? So we have some, some forward model, we write a data term, a data, fi data fitting term with, with respect to our knowledge of this model. Usually it will look like the log distribution of the noise, like in our, in our example, plus some prior that we are assuming on the family of the signals we are going to reconstruct. Now. Solving this pr this problem might be a challenge. It can be a highly non-convex problem, for example. So what I will show you is that you can actually directly estimate this inverse operator. So the inverse operator takes us from the space of measurements to the space of signals of interest. It might be very complicated uh, operator, but so we are solving it by an iterative method. Usually these optimization problems they will not admit a closed form solution. So why don't we just Construct a function that maps directly from measurements to, to, um, uh, to our signals of interest. So we'll see how we can directly learn the inverse operators. And actually, if you if you're if you're crazy enough, you can also put some parameters of the forward model into the learning problem. So if you have control of the of the forward model, like for example, you can do some optimization of the optics in your imaging system. You can solve simultaneously for the best forward model and the best corresponding inverse operator. And this is very useful in computational imaging, where you design some optical system specific for a certain imaging task. Okay? So basically, this will, in, in this way, we will we'll depart very far from putting some trivial assumptions like the L2 distance between the data and the measurements. Okay?